Oh yeah, yeah. We'll see what's going on. Yeah, do the intros. How are you doing today? Yes. Right, everyone. Um, welcome again to our Friday night lecture. Uh, seems like the cause keeping everybody away, but uh, we're glad to see Martin has made it through from Glasgow. He's becoming a bit of a regular, and we're always glad to see him because he's always got something really interesting to talk about. And tonight, it's Powers of 60 to kind of round off our 60th anniversary. Bring the this is our 60th season, mm -hmm. so the 60th anniversary was last October. Technically August. Technically August. Yeah. 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 Kind of in our 60th season now, and um, so Martin has, has uh, modified the usual sort of powers of 10 concept into powers of 60 or something like that. Uh, I'm sure it'll be fascinating stuff. So I'll hand over to Martin, and uh, could you get the lights? Uh, Thank you very much, David. So it's a pleasure to be here. And um, I, of course, minded that the last time I was here was back in June, in slightly warmer and sunnier and, and more daylight conditions. And um, it's amazing how the six months have passed very fast, or seven months now. Um, and of course, it's a great pleasure to have been part of your 60th anniversary and to be part of rounding all of that off with my talk tonight. So, um, I, I, I'm, as ever, you know, trying to juggle multiple things in terms of research and so on, I'm minded that around this time last year I was bearing a very great secret which was our gravitational wave discovery and minded that a lot of you were of course kind enough to come along to that talk in June. I'm talking about something a little bit different but I'll still sneak in maybe just a bit about the gravitational waves as well to give you a wee bit of an update. Um, the other thing that unfortunately I'm juggling as you know, many of us have to contend with is um, rather um, elderly parents and failing health, well in my case it's um, my wife's father uh, she's off down to Carlisle very early tomorrow morning, so we'll see how it goes. Um, I, obviously, uh, I'm, I'm grateful to the hospitality you've, you've already shown me. And if I finish on time, if you'll forgive me just this one time, maybe not being sociable and sticking around for a cup of tea, and if there's a chance to get me on an earlier train, then I'd appreciate doing it. But obviously, if I miss that train, then I'll be very happy to stick around and have a cup of tea. <laughs> I know that there's one at four minutes to ten, so I'm sure I can get that one at any rate. Uh, that's one I did earlier. <clears throat> but anyway, what's Powers of 60 all about? Well, it's really to do with an exhibition that I organised in 2012. And it was partly to mark the transit of Venus and partly to mark the Queen's Diamond Jubilee. Now, I'm not particularly a royalist, so it wasn't really driven by that, but I thought, well, any chance to get a bit of extra publicity? And sure enough, we did. And because, as I'll explain, and we were able to link um, the launch of the exhibition to some specific events that were taking place in June of 2012 coinciding with the um, Diamond Jubilee celebration. So if nothing else you could think of it as an excuse to give people that really weren't at all into the Diamond Jubilee suits, uh, celebrations something else to do for those couple of days and I'll explain uh, what, what that was all about in, in a little while. It's basically to do with the scale of the universe and that's a topic I've been interested in through like, so throughout my entire mm -hmm. professional life, and indeed I've come up to talk to the, um, the folks here about that on a few occasions. So all this gravitational wave stuff I've been doing in the last 15 years or so has been of course a very welcome diversion. I'm hoping to get back to the cosmic distance scale and the scale of the universe in the context of gravitational waves, because ultimately what we want to do is use gravitational wave sources to try and measure how big the universe is and how fast it's expanding. But traditionally, I've done that using uh, methods like distant type 1A supernovae mm -hmm. or using Cepheid variable stars. Again, I've talk, talked about that before. Mm -hmm. And this topic has been back in the news just yesterday, in fact, because, well, you know, for some years there's been a little bit of tension between the estimates of the size of the universe and the rate at which the universe is expanding that we've got using things like the distant supernovae and Cepheid variables and methods that rely on what we call the cosmic background radiation, light coming to us from the very early universe. And, well, that tension has been a bit of a mystery. It's not anything like the factor of two tension and sort of disagreement that there was when I was a graduate student, and that had hung over from the 50s and the 60s, so only a few decades after Edwin Hubble, after whom the Space Telescope is named, had first discovered that the universe was expanding, we were still very much puzzling over just how fast it was expanding and 
in the units that we use, the constant that measures that expansion rate was either 50 or 100. Now, it turns out it looks as if it's probably about somewhere around 75. So you could argue that all we should have done was just average everyone's <laughs> results and avoid all that then controversy and fighting through the 70s and 80s and 90s. But the controversy never fully went away because this measurement with the Hubble telescope, that was the measurement that basically won these guys the Nobel Prize in 2011, so Peramuta, Brown, Smith and Adam Rees, subsequently been refined. Adam Rees published some updated results claiming an accuracy of just a few percent, but again, that was fundamentally using stuff that's relatively nearby. Okay, that's a relative term. Nearby, you're still talking hundreds of millions of light years, but compared with looking at the cosmic background radiation, which is billions of light years away, we're looking at it billions of light years in the past, then I suppose for a long time what people were thinking over the last few years is that perhaps that was the reason for the disagreement, that estimating the size of the universe locally and then extrapolating from that is fraught with danger, but equally estimating it from something that far away like the microwave background is fraught with a different set of danger and that, that maybe you know the truth lay somewhere in between. So these latest results, I'm going to put the slide in again, that's just been in the press um, in the last day basically, well, um, this is using a different technique again, which is called gravitational lensing. It means the bending of light by gravity. So that very much connects with the theme of my talk in June, because there I was talking about gravitational waves. They are a prediction of Einstein's theory of gravity, his general theory of relativity. <coughs> but gravitational lensing is another prediction of that theory. And we might look ahead, for example, to 2019, which is the 100th anniversary of Arthur Eddington's exhibition, expedition to the uh, um, island of Principe, where he was able to measure the deflection of light of stars seen very close to the sun. Not literally, of course, but just in the same direction as the sun during a total solar eclipse. So there's a lot of ideas around measuring the scale of the universe and using it to probe ideas about Einstein's gravity theory that are to do with eclipses, to do with seven variable stars, to do with supernovae, to do with the cosmic background radiation. And there's this rich history through astronomy, not just the time in the 20th century since Edwin Hubble first discovered the expansion, but actually going way much further back than that, where the history of how we've come to understand just how big the universe is, is quite a fascinating story. It's something I've always been fascinated by. So, um, what would it be the Nobel Prize that these guys won, or the Planck results published in 2013, or indeed this new work, which is um, redetermining the scale of the universe using this gravitational lensing method, and actually seems to agree rather more with the Nobel Prize winning results, even though the gravitational lensing data is coming from much further away. So in a sense, it's in conflict with Planck, and that's where, um, you know, if it's true, um, there is something kind of funny going on. But you could say that at least the one thing we can be fairly sure of is that space is big. As they said in uh, Chicken's Gate to the Galaxy, you may think it's a long way down the road to the chemists, but that's peanuts compared with space. We can argue about exactly how big. We're now arguing at the level of a few percent, which is a lot better than that factor of two that I mentioned before. But there are still maybe some and new things to be learned by understanding why it should be that the measurement of how big space is we get from the microwave background radiation should be different from the measurement that we're getting from gravitational lensing reported just in the last 24 hours and then the results um, using the Cepheids and the supernovae. So if we can agree at least that space is big and that it's surely a good thing that we're at the, the level of arguing about a few percent here or there, then how have we come to realise that space is so big? Well, you know, you can now look at diagrams like this from National Geographic, and it starts off at the scale of our solar system, and then it goes to the scale of neighbouring stars, and then it sets that in the context of the, the western spiral arm of the galaxy, and the Milky Way galaxy, as, uh, you know, again, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy says. We are in an um, uncharted backwater of that western spiral arm, in a, a fairly boring place. But then you go up a scale again and you've got the whole of our galaxy, well in fact I think it's to that one next, um, which is in turn part of a little group of galaxies which is part of a much bigger structure called the local supercluster. So space is big, 
Just how big we're still arguing about. But how have we come to realise that space is so big? Well, that takes us back to 2009, which was celebrating the 400th anniversary of Galileo's first observations with the telescope. And you might remember I said in my talk in June that our newly opened up gravitational wave window in the universe is almost a bit like the time when Galileo was first looking with his optical telescope. He saw the craters of the moon, he saw the moons of Jupiter, he could have just said, oh that's very nice, I think I'll stop now and put my feet up. Fortunately he did, he kept looking and discovering new things, other people would build bigger and better telescopes. So, you know, the progress we've made in those 400 years is phenomenal, and one of the key respects in which we've made that progress is understanding a bit better our place in the universe. So for 2008, some of you will remember, one of the things I did was to put together a project on the scale of the universe, but just looking at the scale of the solar system, which itself is pretty mind-blowing, especially if you compare it to the size of Scotland, for example. So you might remember we had a project called the Scottish Solar System, and fortunately I got all the Scottish Astronomy Societies involved, including um, your, your good selves, and the idea was to build a scale model of the solar system with the sun as Glasgow Science Centre. So the main building of Glasgow Science Centre, if that was how big the sun was, then I began by asking myself, well, where would the planets be and how big would they be? Now, remarkably, the planets turned out to agree extremely well with the locations of the various Scottish astronomy societies. I have no idea what this means. You know, Dan Brown would have a feeling on this. I don't think it has any deep cosmic conspiracy going on. But there, you know, there's the sun. So Mercury, well, that was what we made at our Glasgow Uni Observatory, but in Glasgow, the Astronomy Society of Glasgow and Helmsburg and Society, they use the observatory a lot for observing, so that made sense. And then there's Venus. So, so basically what this shows is where the planets actually are and where they would be if you scale everything down to Scotland with the sun as Glasgow Science Centre. And the fact that they all lie pretty close to this straight line means that the model is actually quite good. We could even throw in a few asteroids, a few minor planets like Vesta, 951 Gaspar, Ceres. The matching was really not too bad at all. Now there was, at that time, I'm not so sure if it's still going strong, but there was one called the Clydesdale Astronomy Society, which would occasionally meet in East Kilbride, although they also met down in deep Astarcus, Lanarkshire. And I grew up in East Kilbride, so I was especially keen that they would be part of our Scottish solar system model, and actually, he's probably got the honour of being the Earth, so there you go. Um, Airdrie, on the other hand, that was Mars, so you know, they say women are from Venus, men are from Mars, but it's actually women are from Paisley and men are from Airdrie, so that's uh, Scottish <laughs> solar system model. Um, and then, if you go much further out, you've got the D, you, you guys were sharing the role of Jupiter with Dumfries Astronomy Society and also what was called White Chinshire then, they've changed their name subsequently to the Galloway Forest mm. Astronomy Society because actually, it's interesting to look back, it's eight years ago, but this was round about the time, it was the time, when the Dark Sky Park was designated. So, uh, you know, a lot's happened in that time. This was the time when um, Stargazing Live was just starting up on TV and, you know, it's good to reflect on just how much astronomy is now in the public eye, maybe more so than it was then. If you go further out, um, you've got uh, Saturn, which was shared by Aberdeen and Inverness. Uh, and then, well, somebody had to be Uranus, I suppose. So that was the Keith Ness Astronomy Group. And then Neptune out in Shetland. So I had to make the conscious decision right from the beginning not to include Pluto, which was a bit unfair. And again, if you look at the um, New Horizons mission, you know, I think there's a growing movement you know, maybe got other problems to deal with now Donald Trump's been elected, but um, <laughs> along the scientific community, a sort of growing grassroots movement to try and get Pluto reinstated mm -hmm. yes. as a planet. So <laughs> good, good to see you would all vote for that, as would I. But basically, on the same scale, Pluto would be in the face of violence. And I'm not sure if I know my Scottish history well enough, but there might well have been a time when they belonged to Scotland, or was it ten years? Maybe they've always belonged to Norway, but you know, and we've beat them at football once or twice anyhow, so. Um, so if, if, if we were to extend out to include Pluto, then you'd, you'd want to have an astronomy society in the Faroe Islands. So what did we do with this crazy idea? Well, basically there was a website. What we sought to do was to build a scale model using 
actual objects to represent all of those different planets. Now that was going to be a bit hard with the likes of Jupiter and Saturn. So what we had to do was to project Saturn onto the Eastgate shopping centre in Inverness, which of course they wouldn't let us do throughout the entire year. So this was just one um, short week during International Year of Astronomy, Autumn Moon one I think it was called, where Saturn got to be there, and then there was a building representing Jupiter, which I haven't got a photo on there, but it's basically the library in Dumfries, where the um, Dumfries Astronomy Society made it as a sort of um, hemispherical roof, and it was just about the right size for Jupiter. So there's Uranus, so what they did was get a big tarpaulin that the local scout group could use for other purposes as well, so that was very um, resourceful of the Caithness Astronomy Group. Now there's Earth, this is the um, Museum of Rural and Country Life in East Kilbride, and there's a wee story to tell there, because in fact in the end we had to represent Earth just by a big red balloon, it looks a bit more like Mars, and that's because we got the balloons and they were just the right size, and the plan was to cover the Earth with papier-mâché, and I got some primary school classes involved in this, but we thought what we would do was basically do the papier-mâché at the observatory, the Glasgow University Observatory, inflated the balloon, covered it in papier-mâché, and only then realised that it was too big to get out the door. <laughs> so there we go, we had to bust the balloon, had to destroy the earth, and basically start again with a new one, and there wasn't really time to get it painted. So you could say this is a metaphor for what the earth might look like if we don't do something about climate change, I suppose, um, but at least it is the right size. So, so there we go, that's our line up. And it was a great fun project to be part of. Again, just an interesting reflection on the perils of you know, the, the internet age. Well, we did get ourselves onto Wikipedia, and there's a page there for solar system scale models. And, well, um, basically, you know, I've come to understand a bit the etiquette of Wikipedia, because um, I would edit the page quite justifiably, I thought, because basically our scale was lower, if you like, than anyone else's, meaning that our model of the solar system was closer in size to the real solar system than any other models that are out there. But of course, the downside was, it's not a permanent model. We, we weren't able to have that size of model of Saturn on display in Inverness all the time and so on. So basically, if you go to Wikipedia now, we've been bumped down to another table, which is other models of the solar system temporary, virtual or dual scale, but we are still top of that, mm. and Scotland's not part of the UK, so there we go, you know, a product of its time, um, who, who's to say what that Wikipedia page might look like in the future, I, I shall not comment. Um, anyway, the object of 2009, as I said, was to celebrate the 400th anniversary of Galileo's observations, it was great fun doing a Scottish solar system model, but the moral of the story was, again, this general story that space is big. But the solar system, of course, as we saw from that National Geographic slide, is only a tiny, tiny part of even our galaxy, never mind the whole universe. So how have we come to put all of those pieces of the jigsaw together? Well, let's start with the solar system. How do we know the solar system is that big? Well, of course, Galileo was able to help to complete some of the work of um, Johannes Kepler by providing observational evidence to back up Kepler's model, which itself was based on observations, but they were really just done with the naked eye. They were done by Tycho Brahe, the um, Danish astronomer. But what that led Kepler to propose was a model in which the Sun was at the centre of the solar system. Well, actually not quite the centre, because the planets follow ellipses, and that means the Sun is at one of the focal points of those ellipses. Now, the Earth's orbit's pretty circular, which is just as well for us, because if we did live in an elliptical orbit, it would sometimes get even colder than it feels in Dundee here, and today, and, or indeed even warmer than, than it did back in June. So we don't really change our distance from the Sun all that much, but Mercury does, and indeed Mars does. So what we can do is we can define what we call the semi-major axis of the ellipse, which you can think of like the radius, if it were a circle. It's basically in half the longest distance across the ellipse, and the sun is at one of the focal points, it's a little bit off-centre. So the observations that really helped to nail this model as the correct one include Galileo's observations of Venus, where over a course of several months, he was able to see Venus get smaller and get larger, and to show phases, just like the moon shows phases. And how he interpreted this was not that Venus, of course, was literally 
getting smaller and larger, but just that its distance from the Earth was changing, and was changing quite substantially. And that was a lot easier to explain in a model where the Sun was at the centre, well, okay, close to the centre at one of the focal points, because then you would have a natural explanation for why Venus would sometimes be on the other side of the Sun, and then would be almost fully illuminated as seen by the Earth, whereas when it's on the near side of the Sun, it would be only partially illuminated, it would show that phase-like behaviour. Then the prevailing view up until that point, going all the way back to the likes of Aristotle and Ptolemy, where the Sun went round the Earth and the planets went round the Earth as well, albeit with a somewhat complicated motion where they would actually orbit around an epicycle, like a circle on a circle, then Venus would always show a crescent phase in that model, whereas in this phase it would show, as it does, a ra radically changing phase. So Galileo's observations helped to make sense of the fact, the observed fact, that the Sun, Mercury and Venus never get very far from, apart from each other on the sky. The reason for that is because Mercury and Venus are inside the Earth's orbit. And of course we can do a simulation and cheat by switching off the daytime sky and we can see over the course of a whole year both the Sun getting higher in the sky at midday and then lower at midday in winter. Um, but at the same time, you can also see that Mercury and Venus never get all that far away. So that's what it looks like projected onto the sky. But the crucial thing is that those observations also unlock the capability to get the third dimension as well, to get the distances. In particular, a bit of trigonometry allowed us to get a relative size for the orbit of Mercury, Venus and the Earth, and indeed Mars and Jupiter and Saturn as well. So the basic idea is that as seen from the Earth, Mercury and Venus never get very far away from the Sun. So you can ask the question, well, just how far away can they get when they're furthest away from the Sun? We'll go back to that video again. And, well, I've got to restart it. Let's see if we can do that. Yeah, there we go. So if you watch, Venus, when it's at its biggest angle from the Sun, probably about there, about there, you can measure what that angle is just using effectively like a sextant, like a big protractor. And now armed with the idea that the sun's at the centre and the planets are going round the sun, then that configuration when Venus is furthest from the sun is when this distance here from the Earth to Venus is what we call a tangent to that circle. So it means that this is a right angled triangle. And we know about those, we know about a certain chap called Pythagoras that tells us the relationship between the sizes of the sides of a right angle triangle. In fact, it's a wee bit more than that. If you did some trigonometry at school, or indeed are maybe still using it in your job for all I know, then you'll know about things called sines, cosines and tangents, which are to do with the ratios of the sides of a right angle triangle. So if you measure the maximum angle that Venus can be away from the sun in the sky, then it's basically giving you insight into the ratio of this distance to this distance, or in this context, more interestingly, this distance to this distance. Now, the ratio of that one to that one is the ratio of the size of Venus's orbit to the Earth's orbit. Now, as I said a bit earlier, the orbits strictly aren't circular, although well, Venus and the Earth's orbit actually are pretty close to circular. So we can think of this as the average distance of the planet, what we call the semi-major axis. And these are the numbers. If the, the semi-major axis of the Earth's orbit is one unit, then Venus is 0.72 on that same scale, Mercury 0.39, Mars 1.52, and so on. So on average, Mars is about one and a half times further away from the Sun than the Earth is. Although, because the Earth and Mars are both orbiting the Sun, there can be times when Earth and Mars are much closer together than that, because we're on the same side of the Sun. And that, if you saw the movie The Margin, it's of course very relevant to the story in that film when they're trying to work out the best way to go back and try and, and rescue them. But that leaves the question, how far is an astronomical unit? How far is that distance? Well, that takes us a bit forward in time from the time of Galileo to nearly the end of the 17th century when Edmund Halley travelled to St. Helena Astronomers had all the best travel 
back then, actually we still do, but I certainly don't mean to St Helena myself, but my friend Steve Owens has been there, and um, Steve was actually the UK coordinator for International Year of Astronomy, he used to work at Glasgow Science Centre, and was very heavily involved in getting Galilee Forest Dark Sky Park status, and he had the chance to go to St Helena, because they're trying to get Dark Sky Island in status, but they don't yet have an international airport, so he had to fly to Cape Town, and then spend about two weeks on a ship going there. But of course that's peanuts compared with probably what Edmund Halley had to put up with to get there back in the 17th century. So Edmund Halley went there, stayed there for quite some time, he was making maps of the southern skies and he observed a transit of Mercury on November 7th of that year. That was when Mercury appeared to cross the sun's disk because it was between the earth and the sun. Transits of Mercury are quite rare, transits of Venus are even rarer. And Halley knew that there was going to be a transit of Venus the following century, in the late 1700s, and he realised ahead of time, therefore, that, again, just armed with a bit of trigonometry, you could not just get the relative size of Venus's orbit and the Earth's orbit, but actually get the true size of the two orbits. And the way it would work, another thing you might remember from your high school trigonometry, is similar triangles. So basically the idea is that that triangle there is similar to that one there. But this bit involves the distance from the Earth to Venus, and this bit involves the distance from the Earth to the Sun. So what you've got to do is work out the distance from A to B, so to speak, and then if you know that distance, and you're observing a transit of Venus from A and from B, you'll see Venus cross the Sun along a slightly different path. And that means that if you time when the transit begins and ends in A and B, you can put all of that together and you can get an estimate for the distance from the Earth to the Sun, the astronomical unit. You still need to know the distance from A to B, in other words you need to know the radius or the circumference of the Earth. Now good progress was made there as well. In 1669 a chap called Jean Picard, not Jean-Luc Picard, but Jean Picard, and he was able to measure um, the distance from Amiens to Malvoisin, close to Paris, along the Meridian Line, as we call it, the, um, the great circle of constant longitude, passing through that, um, that, 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 that uh, route. And he was able to estimate a radius for the Earth, which is within 0.2% of the modern day value. So we've now got the radius of the Earth, that means you know the distance from A to B if you observe a transit from two well-separated locations, you can put it all together and get yourself the distance from the Earth to the Sun. So, in 1769, that transit, actually there were two, there was one in 1761 as well, the ones that Edmund Halley had been aware of, well, a lot of planning went in to send people around the world to try and observe it, including Captain Cook with uh, Charles Green and Pierre Salander on board, they observed um, the transit from the island of Tahiti on the 13th of April 1769 and those observations contributed to the worldwide effort and in the end would help, it took a couple of years to analyse the data, would help, um, the, help along the determination of a more accurate estimate for the astronomical unit. By today's standards still not that great but a, a huge leap forward in terms of what was known at the time. Happy is our century, Cassini said, to which has been reserved the glory of being witness to an event which will render it memorable in the annals of the sciences. But we could do better, and in fact, bringing general relativity back into the story, one of the most modern methods was first done in the late 60s, when this chap, Erwin Shapiro, bounced radar of Venus, so Venus came back into the story again, but this time looking at how long it would take those radar pulses to come back. But one of the things that um, that led to was a further realisation that another prediction of Einstein's theory seemed to be absolutely correct. I mentioned the gravitational lensing before, the bending of light that had first been seen by um, uh, Arthur Eddington, but also when light, or indeed radar, passes close to the sun, then it's slowed down because time runs more slowly deeper in that gravitational field. So this effect is called the Shapiro time delay, and that's another way to test general relativity. 
But you throw all of that into the mix and what you get using these radar measurements is the modern day value of about 150 million kilometers. So that's us got ourselves a distance for the astronomical unit. How do you get further? Well, we'll come to that. But I want to now divert focus to the transit of Venus, not the one in 1769, but the one in 2012. Well, actually, there was one in 2004. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky enough to see that. It was partially cloudy, but it was up in sky. and did get to see it for a little bit. And um, it was a bit of a sad reason, because a former graduate student of mine had passed away with cancer, but his wife wanted to scatter his ashes on sky. And we thought it would be a good opportunity to, and, well, it was her idea, to, to do it at the time of the eclipse. So, uh, uh, not the eclipse, the time of the transit. So, in 2004, that transit was seen. They come in pairs. The next one was scheduled for the 5th to the 6th of June, 2012. Now, no transit was going to be visible in this region. And the transit was only going to be just visible at sunrise here in Britain. But nonetheless, we had a shot at it. And given that the next one doesn't happen until the 22nd century, I was determined to give her a go. <laughs> and like I said, June 5th, 6th, well, those dates coincided with the Queen's Diamond Jubilee. So I came up with a grand plan to run an all-night event at Glasgow University as part of Glasgow Science Festival in our Kelvin building. <clears throat> so we linked up with events going on around the world. We linked up with colleagues in, in California, in Hawaii, in Vancouver, in Australia, all of whom were lucky enough to see the eclipse, and to see, so I keep calling it an eclipse, to see the transit. Sadly we didn't, and we were still all wide awake at dawn, and we went down to the one spot where the sun was going to be visible through a gap in the trees just after it rose, but alas, it was chucking it down marine at the time. So I've got a very sad photo, I meant to put this in, of me with my laptop showing um, uh, 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 um, a web stream from Hawaii, and basically my laptop's pointing in the direction where the sun would have been, but I've got one of my friends holding a big umbrella over it to make sure it didn't get wet. So the perils of doing astronomy in Scotland, what can you do? So we've still got a sort of legacy website for this, and this is basically now, as I move into the kind of second half, where I'd like to switch focus to the powers of 60. So transits have played their part in measuring the scale of the solar system. Therefore, it seemed appropriate to link the transit to something to do with the scale of the whole universe. And in fact, also, to perhaps try and be a bit cheesy and link it in to the Diamond Jubilee. So the way we did that was by thinking, well, it's been 60 years since the Queen's coronation. A lot's happened in astronomy since then. In particular, what we've got really good at is observing the universe across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And indeed, since then, we've got quite good at observing it on the gravitational wave spectrum as well. So one of the things we wanted this exhibition to do was to highlight the progress that had been made across the electromagnetic spectrum, but also to highlight, and this is the cheesy part, that because of the finite speed of light, all of that electromagnetic radiation travels at the same speed, but the universe is really, really big, which means that there are many, many objects out there that we're seeing as they were in the past. And in particular, if there happen to be little green men tuning in on their radios and TVs 60 light years away, they would just be getting TV footage of the coronation and wondering what on earth it was all about. So that was the sort of theme we wanted to highlight. So it was all about some of the big questions in science that our ability to probe the entire electromagnetic spectrum were now allowing us to do, but also to emphasize this scale of the universe. And if I wanted to say so, we came up with quite a good big logo there, or the, the O is represented by the diamond ring effect. So the website's still up, and we've had the exhibition, we actually had the exhibition on display up here. It was for Dundee Science Festival in 2013, it was only a year later, and it was in November, and so we just had the various panels on display around the building. <coughs> so, also Giorgio, well Giorgio basically opened in 1957, so again within a few years, um, so it has been around for about 60 years, in fact, you know, it's going to probably be marking its own 60th anniversary at some point this year as well. 
And as I said, we've got this whole electromagnetic spectrum, this ability to observe across the whole spectrum. And again, to just keep loading on the cheesiness, we thought, well, diamond jubilee, diamond ring, eclipses, scale of the universe and all that. The diamond ring effect is a particularly beautiful effect. I mean, I've never had the chance to see this. I'm very much hoping that I will this summer, because I'm going to the US to see the eclipse as it crosses um, the continental US. I did try to see the one in 99, but again, was thwarted by the clouds. Um, although just experiencing the darkness as it rolled down was just quite amazing. But I would love to see this. So eclipses, well, they've played their part in getting the scale of things as well. Because, well, it was Hipparchus who, quite a clever chap, came up with some important Sorry, oh, I'm not in good form tonight. Aristarchus, it's easy to confuse your Greek astronomers. Aristarchus, who came up with um, a, a very um, clever line of reasoning using observations of lunar eclipses. So basically what Aristarchus came up with was the idea that the Earth went round the Sun. So the familiar kind of urban myth that it was, you know, those silly Greeks thought that the, the Sun went round the Earth. Well, they didn't all. And it's worth just pausing for a second to think about the reasoning. So Aristarchus was able to get an estimate of the Earth-Moon distance from the eclipse geology, basically just to do with the curvature of the shadow. So he had a crude idea of how big the Earth was. In fact, we don't know whether a chap called Eratosthenes really existed, but there's this idea about Eratosthenes allegedly being aware that on a certain day the sun would shine vertically down a well in Syene, but not vertically in Alexandria, and he could get an idea of the Earth. So first of all, you know, not all the Greeks thought the Earth was flat, and indeed some of them had a fairly good estimate of its size. So what Aristarchus did was to take that estimate of the Earth's size and then use some trigonometry to piece together an estimate of the Earth-Moon distance based on the radius of curvature of the Earth on the Moon. And then he reasoned that when the Moon's just going about its regular business, orbiting the Earth, sometimes you see a half-Moon. And if you measure the angle between the Moon and the Sun at that time, then you can get an estimate of the distance from the Earth to the Sun, again just using Pythagoras and right angle triangles. Now that method is a really sound method, it's just it's very hard to measure that angle precisely because it's really close to 90 degrees. But it's a very sound method. And although he didn't get a terribly accurate answer, his answer was good enough to make him realise that the Sun was much larger than the Earth because it was much further away than the Moon. And it made sense to him to have the small thing going around the big thing, rather than the other way around. Now why didn't everyone believe him? Well, it's partly for quite good reasons. Firstly, many of his Greek philosopher colleagues would say, well if the Earth's going around the Sun, why don't we fall off? Which in a sense is quite a reasonable question. <laughs> and it would take many hundreds of years until the time of Isaac Newton, and then ultimately Albert Einstein, to provide a decent explanation for that. But the other thing that they objected to was that if the Earth is going around the Sun, then if you look at faraway stars, or indeed even the other planets, then why don't you see them shifting in position, what we call a parallax shift. So if the idea is, as we now know, if the Earth's going around the Sun and you look at a nearby star in January, and compare its position in, say, July, then the star will appear to shift with respect to background stars. Now that's all very well. That's what you would expect to see, since it wasn't measured by the Greeks. That was a big problem for Aristarchus' idea of the Earth going around the Sun. But we now know that nearby stars do show an annual parallax shift, but it's absolutely tiny. It was only detected in the middle of the 19th century, and was the first key step to get us beyond the scale of just the solar system, to start to get a handle on the scale of the Milky Way galaxy. Even the nearest star, only shows a parallax shift about one two thousandth the width of the full moon. Now, that's, say, about the distance of, um, well, it is the new star, it's Proxima Centauri, and that's been in the news a lot recently, because we think we've found an extrasolar planet going around Proxima Centauri. It might even look a bit like that. But that's a distance of about three to four, like, well, four light years, but it's just a bit more than what we call one parsec, which is not to do with the Kessel Run and the Millennium Falcon, 
but instead is a unit of distance. One parsec corresponds to one parallax second, one second of arc, a 3,600th of a degree, and it's about three and a quarter light years. So now we're outside the solar system, we're now very much into the realms of the powers of 60. So what I was seeking to do was to look at how many jumps of a factor of 60 would you need in order to get to the edge of the universe. So the first stopping point was 60 light years away, because again that was this cheesy connection with the um, Diamond Jubilee and the coronation, that if you were little men on a planet 60 light years away, then you might just be able to tune in to the coronation now. And one such planet is Beta Pictoris. Although the prospects of any little green men are probably fairly slim, because this is quite a young system, and it's still got a disk with lots of debris around it. So not really the kind of place you would want to look for life like us. But one of the ways we know that is because of observations with satellites like this one. This is Fuse observing in the ultraviolet. So again, what I wanted to bring in was this idea of observing across the whole electromagnetic spectrum. So this is our first step, 60 light years away, and this is an artist's impression of the Beta Pictoris system. And in fact, what Fuse was able to tell us, because of observations with um, very good spectroscopy, looking at spectral lines, was a planet in that system with a lot of carbon <coughs> emission. And I noticed um, in New Scientist just the other day that for the first time people have been able to make metallic hydrogen in the lab by basically having hydrogen under such extreme pressure that it winds up taking a kind of metallic structure. And there's been ideas for a long time around that Jupiter might have metallic hydrogen in its core. There's even been the rather more outlandish suggestion which is that Jupiter could have a giant diamond in its core if there was enough carbon and then the pressure would arrange it in the same configuration as in diamond. Well, that's what the evidence from the few satellites suggested one of these planets actually has, that very possibly has a diamond core. So, again, the cheese just keeps getting ladled on thickly because we come up with this idea of a diamond planet for the Diamond Jubilee. And a very nice lady called Lynette Cook, who I've never met before, but I'd followed her work for a long time. She writes occasionally and draws wonderful illustrations for Sky and Telescope and Astronomy Now and all these magazines. So I got in touch with her, and of course all the images I've showed you so far have just been freely available in the web, with the exception of this one. And even that, you know, Lynette Cook has not um, had any problem with people using this one. But this diamond planet image, well, you know, um, I felt that it was only fair that we should give her due credit and indeed pay her a little bit. You know, we basically bought the um, digital rights to use in the exhibition. And therefore, I'm duly acknowledging that now. So this is just her rendering of what this diamond planet might look like. So it's basically a carbony surface and the interior has been um, revealed by um, an asteroid collision or something like that. So there you go, 60 light years away, we're at Beta Pictoris, and we've got ourselves a diamond planet. So all is well in the British Empire. <laughs> if we go another factor of 60 out, we're at the Butterfly Nebula. This is about 3,600 light years from the Earth. So you're going to need to know your 60 times cable. Mm -hmm. um, I've actually got a few crowd notes just to make sure I get the numbers right. <laughs> um, the Butterfly Nebula is an example of what we call a planetary nebula. This is basically the fate that the, the Sun is likely to have at the end of its life, where the outer part of the Sun will just gradually, slowly drift off, probably swallowing up the Earth in the process, leaving behind a white dwarf, um, a dense companion. So this is a beautiful image, it's been done with the Hubble Space Telescope, and, um, well, um, the Hubble Space Telescope of course has been the real workhorse for measuring the distance scale, and then were the guys that got the Nobel Prize. So and it's important to include that in our story as well. Another really beautiful image to feature on our journey. And if we go up now to um, our third milestone, uh, oh actually, somehow I think I forgot that out of order. But that's very odd. That's very odd indeed. I seem to have missed an image. I'll just tell you about that. It's actually quite ironic that I should have missed this image because the third image you're not going to believe this, you'll think I've set this up. The third image is to do with dark matter, so it's quite appropriate that the image shouldn't actually be there. But what the image is supposed to show is a dwarf galaxy in the constellation of Ursa Minor, which is about 60 cubed light years away, or about 200,000 light years away. 
Now that dwarf galaxy is, a, as the name suggests, very small, very faint. And the reason that's been important is that we've been using the Fermi gamma ray satellite to look for gamma ray flashes in that galaxy. And the idea is that dwarf galaxies proportionally have got probably more dark matter than bigger galaxies. Bigger galaxies have got dark matter too, but they've got a lot of luminous matter as well. And dark matter, we still don't really know what it is, but one of the things it might be is elementary particles. That's the most likely explanation, but just a lot of them. And sometimes those elementary particles might decay. They might maybe collide with another one and sort of annihilate each other. So they would just disappear in a, a flash of light. Sort of, it's basically E equals MC squared, converting matter into energy. And many of the dark matter theories suggest that such dark matter candidates, if they do annihilate, would give off gamma rays, just a very brief flash of gamma rays. So what the Fermi satellite has been looking for is flashes that we might interpret as due to the annihilation of dark matter particles. Mm. So that's our third step. Moving swiftly on to our next milestone. This is Centaurus A. Mm. 60 to the power of 4 light years, and this is when I, my knowledge of the 60 times table starts to let me down. So it's about 13 million light years from the Earth. And this is an image, it's a sort of composite image actually of several observations done with um, an infrared satellite called Spitzer and also NASA's Chandra X-ray satellite. So what you're seeing is some optical, you've maybe seen these um, dust trails in Centaurus A before. Um, uh, there's also the infrared, the kind of diffuse light around, and then what you've got is X-ray emission, which is seen as two big sort of lobes either side. And um, those are often quite bright in radio as well, and that means that these galaxies are often known as radio galaxies, but they actually give off light across the whole electromagnetic spectrum. And that radiation is thought to be due to stuff accelerating onto a supermassive black hole at the centre. And as it does, it gives off light and um, gives off a certain type of light that we call synchrotron radiation, which can um, produce these big jets that go either side of the central black hole. So again, very dramatic image. And um, yeah, there we go. That's the, um, that's the Chandra X-ray satellite, which um, produced some of this image. But increasingly common is that we combine um, uh, images from different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum to try and give us the overall picture. 60 to the power of 5 light years, and I definitely need to check my notes here, 700 million light years more or less. And that is another one of these big radio galaxies, this time called Cygnus A. And it's one of the most powerful radio sources in the sky. It was discovered in the early 1950s, so again, around the time of the diamond, um, well, around the time of the coronation that we were marking with the diamond jubilee. And um, this is observations of Cygnus A using the Very Large Array Radio Telescope. Not done by Jodie Foster, but she did use the VLA in the movie Contact, you might remember. So um, again, the common theme here is um, that with the opening up of the radio part of the spectrum in particular, which was the first real um, opening up beyond the optical, then we began to learn things that we certainly hadn't known before. We began to learn that there were these very strong radio sources giving off intense jets of radio emission. And then we would later learn that that could often be in x-rays as well. And we believe that these big lobes of radio emission, again, are coming about because there's a supermassive black hole in here at the centre. 60 to the power 6. About 45 billion light years from the Earth. Now I should begin by saying, if you want to see the Big Bang Theory in telly, you might remember it starts off by saying the whole universe was in a hot dead state and nearly 14 billion years ago, expansion started. So if the universe is only 14 billion years old, how can we be looking at something 45 billion light years away? Well, the point is, we're seeing it as it was back then, but the universe has been expanding all that time. So if we ask ourselves, how far away is this light now? Well, in some sense, the answer to that question is pointless to ask, because we can't see that light now 14 billion years after the universe began, 
But for the sake of argument, if we do, in other words, if we try and say, how big is the universe now? Not the part we can see, but how the part we can see, where is it now? How far has it been taken as the universe has expanded? Then actually, you're talking about 45 billion light years across. So that really, in some sense, is the, the limit. And this is observations done with the Wilkinson microwave anisotropy probe. And this pattern of light and dark tells us that the universe had different temperatures in different directions back then. Our understanding of all of that is refined all over the years from, first of all, Kobe, a very blurry map of the microwave sky, but like what you'll look like if I take my glasses off. <laughs> but then, Planck, we get a nice sharp, clear view. In fact, there's the Planck map with much more fine detail. So what does all of that information mean? Well, what it's basically telling us is something about how the universe looked when it was hot enough that neutral hydrogen couldn't exist. So I think a good analogy here, I mean this deserves a whole talk in itself, but a good analogy here, you've maybe come across this before, is to think of looking into a fog. Because you can't see beyond a certain distance because the light gets scattered. And the microwave background represents a point where prior to that the universe was so dense and so hot that light got scattered. So the last point we can see to is that microwave background. So basically, that's about us, we're, um, how am I doing? Yeah, I've still got a wee bit of time, so just another few minutes. We've, we've talked across the whole of the electromagnetic spectrum, and we've showed you observations that get us to the, the very edge of the universe. Of course, our understanding of um, what the universe has been up to is far from complete. There are still many unanswered questions. I began with this you know, most recent little enigma about the expansion rate of the universe, what we call the Hubble constant. Maybe the next big thing in terms of the um, multi-wavelength astronomy that's coming up is the James Webb Space Telescope due for launch in the next couple of years. And well, that's going to be even bigger than Hubble and bigger than Herschel, which was a, an infrared telescope as well. But it's going to be um, not quite so far into the infrared as Herschel was, just a little bit more into the infrared than Hubble. And well, it's going to tell us a lot. But when I was here in June, of course, the big story was all about gravitational waves. So let me just end with just a few more remarks about that. So the final panel in our exhibition is about looking beyond the electromagnetic spectrum about what we might learn if we were able to do that. Well, of course, I didn't know back in 2012 that we would make the discoveries quite as soon, but it's been quite a ride these last few months since we made the discoveries using the LIGO detectors, a very different sort of telescope, fundamentally different principles. What we're looking for is changes in space-time that we pick up by using incredibly sensitive lasers, the ripples in space-time produced by very violent cosmic events. And the one I talked about in June was our first detection back in February of 2016. We announced it almost exactly a year ago, and this was the signal seen by the two LIGO detectors, more or less simultaneously, which we interpreted as due to the in-spiral towards each other and the merger and then the settling down called the ring down of two massive black holes. And I showed this movie back in June, which is a rendering of what we think is going on. Space time being very dramatically disturbed by these two black holes shaking things up. And at the moment when they merge, they get this spike, which is a release of gravitational wave energy. Actually more powerful, but 50 times more powerful than all the light from all the stars in every galaxy in the whole universe. But only for a small fraction of a second. So what's coming up next? Well, let me, you know, just not retrain all the ground I covered in June, but just mention a couple of later developments. So in particular, in June I was mainly focusing on this part of the electromagnetic of the gravitational wave spectrum, very high frequency. But we've made significant progress over the last year towards um, a spaceborne detector. So just a few days, in fact, after I came to Dundee to talk about um, the LIGO discoveries, um, a mission called LISA Pathfinder reported its first results. And it's a, a technology demonstrator for a spaceborne mission called LISA, which will put three such satellites in an orbit about a million and a half kilometers behind the Earth. And I'm delighted to say that just over a week ago, um, several hundred of us around the world submitted to the European Space Agency our proposal 
for full blown Lisa because the Lisa Pathfinder results were just so good. So, okay, it's going to take a while, 2035 probably before it will fly, but we're on our way. And it's the, the L3 mission, that means the third in the big large missions that ESA is planning. So they're planning one to go to Jupiter called JUICE, Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer. They're planning an X ray mission and then it's gravitational waves. And well, one of the things I very much hope we might do with gravitational waves, as I said, is try to measure the scale of the universe, but a completely different way. Will we agree with the gravitational lensing guys that have just been in the news this week? Will we agree with the guys that won the Nobel Prize for their supernova <coughs> results? Will we agree with the microwave background measurements? We don't know. But as I said at the beginning, the one thing I've learned is that the universe is really, really big. And in fact, well, again, I've begun by saying I'm not much of a royalist, but the other big, wholly unexpected development for me after doing this exhibition in 2012, I don't know whether I had anything to do with this happening, but I got the shock of my life in November 2015 when I was awarded the MBE. And in fact, when I went to collect that, the Queen's opening gambit was, the universe is really rather big, isn't it? <laughs> and I did have the presence of mind to say, yes, ma'am, and it's getting bigger all the time. <laughs> so never want to miss the chance to indulge in a bit of cosmology education. But as we've seen in that news story just from the other day, we don't quite know how fast it's getting bigger. We'd like to know better. But I think it's pretty amazing that we can measure the expansion rate of the universe and indeed the size of the universe to precision of just a few percent. So that's something to be very proud of. And a lot of it has been due to the opening up of the multi-wavelength universe, which has basically happened over the last 60 years. So if you want to check out the online exhibit, it's all still there. And I'm maybe hoping, well, I don't know whether we'd have to link it to some other upcoming event. Don't want to take fate and see the Queen will still be around when I do a Powers of 70 exhibition. <laughs> but it was a great deal of fun to do. And I did learn a lot about the size of our universe and it's been a pleasure to come and share it with you tonight. Thank you very much. Right, that was a uh, fantastic one. Yeah. Really yeah. amazing insights into the just how big the universe is. <laughs> yeah, so lots of nice pictures as well. So it's, lots of nice again, pictures. that's you know, what I learned from doing this is just how stunningly beautiful some of these oh, images yes. are. Yes, it's quite yeah. amazing indeed. So as I say, that all the images are still there and feel free to download them. Got permission from Lynette Cook if people want to download the carbon planet, then you're right. very welcome to. Do we have any questions? No. Yes. Well, thank you, Mark, for that super talk. It's still ringing my mind from your talk in June. Yeah. The fact that how frequently uh, gravity waves might be detected, should we have the equipment to do so? Yes, indeed. But so, you said once every 15 minutes. Well, that's right. That was a reset at the time. <laughs> that was a reset at the time. Again, it's maybe, you know, think of that in the context of what's been seen tonight, how big the universe yes, is. Yes, yes. Obviously, the vast majority of those sources are always going to be too far away for us ever to detect at all. It's a bit like me trying to estimate the population of Dundee from the number of people in this room, you know? You can do it, but it's going to have a very large uncertainty. The more we observe, the better that estimate of the uncertainty will get. So watch this space. I can't give away any more. The same as everyone is up and running. Well, I asked a question. I thought you might say, oh, perhaps a few times a year. Yeah. Yeah. When you said that, it's just yeah. stuck with me. Well, by the end of the advanced LIGO, um, upgrades, which won't really be complete for another three or four years, we're anticipating making one detection about uh, once per week. Oh. But of course, you know, we're only probing a small fraction of the universe. Yes, 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 All yes. the rest of the universe, that's where the once every 15 yes, minutes comes from. Incredible. That's really yeah. giving you an idea of the depth of the universe. Thank you. Just yeah. incredible. Before I just add over on the end, yep. that was a question, but it's a comment. That, um, that was quite, I'm quite sad just now because. You said that Eratosthenes might be a myth. He's been my hero. For <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, he is. Well, let me clarify. I'm actually quoting no less than Carl Sagan in this. Um, I, I, I was told, I'm talking about this, where um, you know he, 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 he re related the story in Cosmos beautifully, I thought. Yes. But I, I heard him give a talk um, some years later, and what he said is that it's not clear if that was a single person, or it might have been 
a kind of amalgamation of several people who tackled the problem over a slightly more extended yeah, period. But there certainly were people, yes. or possibly one person, who went through that chain of reasoning. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So it's a beautifully simple yes. idea and to, 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 to interpret it. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Following the Greek thing, we said about uh, dismissed because power Yeah. But did the Greeks even realise the stars were stars? I didn't they think there was some sort of fixed sphere. Well, that's why I mentioned even with the power. That's why I mentioned even with the planets. I mean, what they did realise was that yes, if the stars are fixed on a very far away crystal sphere, then you wouldn't get any power but if the planets are in crystal spheres which are closer to us than that, and the Earth is moving around the Sun, well, there's first of all, and I didn't even mention this, there's the problem of how the Earth gets through those crystal spheres. <laughs> and then secondly, if that's the case, then why don't we see a parallax of the planets? Now, you do, it's just too small to, you know, to, to measure. What's this thing about parallax? It all leads up to the big question of working out the parallax of the Sun, which is why the Tahiti expedition Sure, absolutely. Well, it's, I mean, I framed it in the, the, the context of measuring yeah, the astronomical right. unit, but actually, one point I was going to make along the way, it took a while to get here, but it's maybe worth just going back. The Cassini result, I mean, this is, you know, the sort of thing I spend my life doing, worrying about error distributions and all that. The Cassini result, um, yeah, he was well chuffed about it and everything, but you'll see, of course, that the error isn't sort of symmetrical between 90 yeah. and 94, and that's yeah. because what they were really measuring was one over the distance, yeah. yes. the parallax angle. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that translates yeah. into an asymmetric error yeah. distance. Yeah. And you know, that leads into something called Malmquist bias, which people now worry about in cosmological distances. I've yeah. uh, spent my life doing this sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Never been to Tahiti though. <laughs> well, I have. Um, Excellent. Point to Venus. So, <coughs> any other questions at all? Oh, well, I think we can uh, thank Mark again for a suggestion. Yeah. <laughs>